But before I introduce MapTrack, let's first go into the problem that we try to solve. So right now, with more and more with the microservices architectures and the different, you have different APIs, the third party APIs, which you have, which have certain representation, certain model, and then you have your own DB model and you're doing these mappings constantly between these different APIs. So it's, it's also a view model versus a DB model or third-party REST API, not just other microservices, not zero microservices. And most of the time, the types can be similar, but they're not quite the same. For example, here, we have, um, we, we, have a, whoops, we, we have a car, which has a car and a car DTO. So DTO is, let's say, the REST representation. And we can see that the types are a bit, so the, some types are, have the same names, uh, uh, but they have different types. For example, like the model in our database layer, let's say ha it's an it's a, it's a object, uh, whereas on the car DTO it's a string, or you have different names between the parameters, like number of seeds versus seed count, and so on and so forth, or like date or big decimal and so on. So how you can solve this? So one way is to do is, is to, do, to do it manually. So basically, you're just going to write these getter setters and create your objects and invoke everything. But this code is not really fun code to write. It's really boring code, and it's also error prone because it might lead you might miss some mapping because you want you add something on one side and you will miss that it's there. Another approach, which is automatic, is using reflection. So there are other reflection-based libraries there. However, with this, you lack of type safety, so you don't have any information during compilation time. You will just you just have information on runtime, so you don't you don't see it until it's too late, and then you also pay the performance penalty. So, re doing reflection takes some time, and it's also if some of you have used this kind of libraries, it's really difficult to debug because. It's some kind of reflection library, which is a single point of entry which invokes your code. So that's why we have MapStruct. MapStruct is, is an annotation processor and generates Java code for you. So it's, it's really easy to, to use it. You just need to define an interface. So you, all your mappings are within an interface. So you define, like here at the bottom of the example, you define your interface, you define your, what you want to map. And MapStruct will generate you the implementation of this class and all this boring code. And it has no re it uses no reflection and it has no runtime dependencies, and you only need it during compilation. And these annotations which you see, they are not even in the bytecode, so they are only in the source code. And just to see for performance measurement, so MapTrack is the second one from the left. The first one on the left is a manual code, so it's as as fast as writing manual code. And there are some other benchmarks here. So this is an independent benchmark across different uh, mapping frameworks. This is not done by us in the MapStruct project. This is just some small slide how you can install MapStruct. Uh, there are different examples, Maven, Gradle, and so on, and uh, links to our IDE support, so like for Eclipse or IntelliJ plugin. And now I'm just quickly going to show you how it looks like to work with MapStruct. So as I said before, we have this car here which has certain fields, and our car DTO, which has other fields. And it's as easy, so what we need to do is we need to write, one second. So wh what we need to do is we need to write an interface, which will be our car, ma our car mapper. <coughs> ah, before we do that, just to show you how you need to configure it within Maven. So it you need to, Add the MapStruct dependency, so this will bring you the annotations, uh, how you can, that will tell the annotation processor what needs to generate. And you need to configure the compiler, you need to tell that this is the annotation processor, so this is the whole logic for MapStruct, which it's used, it's used during compilation time. And once you do that, you can create an interface, you can say this, this is a mapper, and you compile that. And when it's compiled, you will see that it generated a, a file for us. So it generated Java code, and this will then be later compiled into bytecode by the Java compiler. Then we, what we said we want to map into a car, so into a car DTO uh, from, a, from a car. You do that, you save, and you build in IntelliJ, and it will generate the method for us. So now we can see it's created, so it does null checks, 
it created the object that you want to create and then just basically in uh, make or checks now it also has some implicit conversion so we, if you when you convert from a, from a local date into a string it uses the ESO local date to perform the formatting or from big decimal to double and so on there are other implicit conversions in there we can also s we also see that uh, so we can also see that there was a warning outputted into our compilation so this is what I meant by error prone, that you might miss, let's say we have the seed count, but it's not mapped. If you are, want to be really, really strict, what you can even do is, uh, what you can do, you can unmap target policy. So you can define that, you can say that it's error. What does this mean is when we compile now, instead of a warning, you will get a compile problem. So you won't be able even to start the application, it will tell you immediately. And what to avoid to fix that problem, what we need to do, we're adding this mapping. We say what's our target. So the target is our seed count. <coughs> so all these auto completions is thanks to the IntelliJ plugin that we have here. And we have the source. So what is the source? Our source would be the number of seeds. And we, when we compile now, see there is no more error. And when we go into our implementation, we can see that our seed count was now, it was uh, mapped, in, it was used in the mapping. Let's say you're not satisfied with the formatting of the date, so it because it uses this ESO local date, you wanna have it fix. You can also do that, you can just add a uh, mapping annotation, you can, s you can, we will say that our manufacturing date, uh, we want to target that, and we wanna give a custom date format. So we define that, the cu our custom date format, and we're built. And once it's built and we go in our implementation, we can now see that it uses our, our format, which, 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 we, which, uh, which we just discussed. Then let's go, so this was our car mapper. Uh, let's say when we go to our car, we have this, uh, we have this model which was commented out, and I uncomment the getters and setters. And now we compile again, uh, but uh, there is no error now because that's how IntelliJ works, so I have to recompile this file. And when you recompile, you will see an error. It says that it cannot map this property model into string. And it even gives you a suggestion what you can do to, to solve this. So one way to do that, we can define our own method, which will do the mapping from a model. And let's say like if the model is now, we return now, otherwise we can we get the model name. And now when we compile, MapStruck will know how to map this and we can see in our implementation that it actually uses our 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 method here that we that we just defined. Another approach to solve this problem would be to use there is this so called um, nested uh, nested source type. So we have our source and you can define the model and then we define the name for that and we can remove this method and then recompile again. And now we can actually see that it generated, so for doing the model, it generated a helper method which just does these invocations for us, so does the null checks, name and so on. Good, so let's say we have something more complex. We have a uh, different mapper, so we have a garage here, which has the, a, a list of collection of these cars and the garage detail, which has the same. So we go in our garage mapper, uh, and then we compile it. Now we are going to have an error, so the same error that we had before, because it doesn't know, it what, what MapStruck tries to do, it tries to generate the mapping for us. So it tries to map from, from generate this method from list of cars to list of car details, and then it tries to generate the method for the cars. Uh, but we, because we have our car mapper, what we need to do is we need to tell MapStruck that it needs to use this. So just tell MapStruck during compilation time, and when we compile this, we can now see, now there's no errors, and when we go into our implementation, we can see that it invokes the car mapper actually. And the car mapper 
is basically it's used based on this uh, helper framework, or that uh, helper factor that we have that gives you back instances of the mapper. So there is there is options that you can also use this. Let's say when you want to use this within your own code, because that's what you want to do, right? Uh, one option is to you can get an instance of the mappers. So you, uh, let's say we have our garage mapper through the mappers factory. So you will get the mapper. So this would be uh, garage mapper. So this would be an easy way. Um, Mapstruct does in the back g gets the class and instantiates the mapper. But you can also just invoke the the, the, in the garage mapper implementation. However, most of the time you use a dependency injection. So because I use Spring, I'm going to show the Spring example, but it also works with CDI and JSR uh, 313 in general. So for that, we need to define our component model, which would be Spring in our case. We also need to do that for the car mapper. So we have this, uh, no, not, not use the component model, which is Spring. And then we, we compile our application and now, if we go to the mappers, we'll see that it has this add component annotation from Spring. So you just need to make sure that that your package will get scanned where your mappers are, so they get instantiated. And our garage mapper has the component, and it has this yeah the auto wired of the field. If you don't want to use field injection, because you shouldn't be using field injection, it's much better if you use constructor injection. We also have support for that. And what it will do, it will just create a, a constructor for you where we instantiate, where you instantiate this. And you can easily now test this as well, just instantiate this class and you can test that. Good. So that was from my demo. I mean, it's from my demo. So what did we show s here? So we showed the advantages of the code generation that Mapstruct uses. So it's, it's type safe. If you have different types which you don't, I mean, which you can't map, it will tell you on compilation time compared to reflection-based libraries, which will just give you an error when, you, when the mapping happens. As we saw, it has a really quick feedback loop. So you write your mapper, it creates the implementations for you, it shows you errors, warnings, and so on. It's easy to debug. So this code that generates is a code that more or less every one of us here in the room will, will write by hand when you write it. But it's just boring code to write. And it's fast because it just does plain method calls. You can easily see your, where your getters, where your setters are used. So it's everything is shown. And there are no runtime dependencies. And works, so because it's an annotation processor, it hooks all the way down to the Java compiler, which means that it works on your command line, in your Gradle build, in your Maven build, even if you want to use Ant, it works there as well. And it works in your IDE. So it, it, you don't need to install any plugin for it to work in the IDE, because the IDE gives all this to the compiler. Of course, that was not all from Abstract, because it's, um, it's a short presentation. Uh, there is much more there. So there is collection mappings, which we showed, but you can also have, you also have update methods. So when you need to update objects, you have update methods which will generate different kind of mapping. There is also multiple source parameters, so you can map from multiple objects into a single object. Then you have object factories which allow you to control the way you instantiate your, your classes. So let's say if, you, if your classes have some constructor which is not a default constructor and you want to pass something to it, with an object factory you can do that and you can instantiate this object. Then you can control what happens before the mapping, after the mapping. So if you want to set, compute certain fields, you can do that with these annotations. Then you can even go further. Let's say you have some way. So the way that MapStruct works and how it defines properties, it uses the bin convention. So it finds all your getters, it finds all your setters, and it defines the pro and finds the properties from that. If you have some different convention, let's say for your getter setters, you can write an um, custom naming strategy and that will then tell Mapstruct what it, Mapstruct will use that then to decide whether a method is a, it's a method for a property or not and what's the name of the property. Then there are qualifiers which you can use to 
basically define, have the same kind of mappings, then use it in different locations and so on. And you can also do inheritance, so define one place where your mappings are and then use that uh, in a different place. Some future work, so what we want to do, what we did with the last version is one of our biggest requested feature was the builder, uh, so support for builders, so we have that now, which is really good. And the next step is we want to have, we want to be able to use constructor arguments when we're creating the mapping target. So this means that you won't need to make your Kotlin data classes late in it and optional and so on. You can make everything mandatory and MapStrike will then properly generate the class for you without the need to make your objects uh, mutable. We want to also do annotation composition so that you, for to change the way that basically use meta annotations within MapStrike to, to support that. <laughs> and uh, something that we already started working on is mapping from an object into a map. So during compilation time, we have this information. So why not just generate a map with string string or string object or whatever you want and just generate this for you. Or maybe once we have this in place, then it will be also really easy to just generate a JSON node from it because there is no difference between a map and JSON node from a, a low level technical point of view in the eyes from abstract. So these are some links for MapStract. Uh, our where is the source code? We have our discussion groups uh, channel where you can ask questions. Where m our contributor, so me and the other contributors of MapStract are there, and the entire community is there answering questions. And yeah, follow get get MapStract or hashtag MapStract on Twitter if you want to get news about MapStract. And yeah, so thanks for everyone. And if you have some questions for MapStruct or, yeah, I can help, I can answer them for you now. So the question is, what about Enum? So that's a really good question. And actually, I didn't show that. But actually, if we go into our car mapper and see our category, our category is an enum. And on the other side, our category is a string. So what MapStruct does, it invokes the, so if you go into the implementation, for the category, it calls the name on the enum, and that's how it generates. If we want to do it the reverse uh, way, so from, from an enum, from a string into an enum, it will call value of, and it will give you the, yeah, it will generate the enum for you. So that's one of the implicit mappers, actually. Thanks for the question. If, if you have a mapping from objects to maps, can you make a mapping from maps to objects? So, so, so the object, so the question is if you have mapping from object into map, whether you can uh, do mapping from map, from map into an object, right? Yes, yes. So yeah, so that would be the next step. So once we have object into map, it's also, I mean, the reverse will be part of the same support. And it's, I mean, it's quite easy. It's, we, we know the name of the field, so we, if, if you assume that the name of the property is the key in the map, we just need to do it. So my, one of the goals would be not to use, uh, to directly use the JSON node so that you would get even more speed up because you won't need to use, uh, you won't need to use reflection from Jackson to generate the JSON for you. Using the JSON node will be much faster. So the question is for code generation, why did we choose to use an annotation processor for that? So the reason why we chose an annotation processor is because it's built in into the compiler. So we don't have to do anything specific for, we don't have a pl custom plugin for custom Maven plugin or custom in uh, IntelliJ Eclipse plugins. So it just works with one implementation everywhere, basically. And it works with the Eclipse compiler. So all our tests run with the Java C compiler and the Eclipse compiler. So yeah, we can. I think because the time is over, we can continue afterwards uh, the discussion. Thank you, everyone, for coming to my presentation.